Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Today we're going to have a conversation. Uh, we're going to have this, this kind of sermon that I've kind of been thinking about, and it's the name of it is kind of weird considering what's going on like in our province, but this is like the thought I've been thinking about. And something that I've kind of thought about for a long time is this kind of thought um, of burn the ships. And it's this common phrase that we hear um, where basically it's about the burning of the past material to kind of create or step into uh, the future. And the, this, this phrase kind of got its... its uh, its name in the year of 1519, and this is Hernan Cortez when he arrived in the New World with 600 men, and upon arrival, he made history by burning his ships. This sent a clear message to his men that there is no turning back, and two years later, he succeeded in his complete conquest of the Aztec Empire. I'm not saying this was a great guy, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying this is the story. And so when he arrived in what is today Mexico, his soldiers did not want to fight. Obviously, they retired from a long voyage, and the people of the land were not very friendly, of course. They're trying to take their land, and it was a strange land. And so Cortez, who wanted to conquer this new lad, had none of what his men were saying. To motivate his men, he burned the ships uh, at the waterline. And now they were all faced with this reality that they're stuck, right? There's no way back to where they were from. There's no way back. They're here now, and this is their future. And so he burned their ships, and, and, and this kind of phrase is, is gives us no choice. If we look at our lives, it gives us no choice but to go forward, right? When we look at our lives, I think there's a lot of things in our life that are actually holding us back from the future that God is trying to create and the calling and the purpose that God has for each and every one of us. And there's some ships or some things that are holding us back from where we are supposed to be. And in the Bible, there's actually a story recorded many years before this infamous Cortez decision, and it's in 1 Kings chapter 19. And this is the moment where Elijah, he chooses Elisha to take his place, that he's gonna be the next prophet for the land, the next kind of leader for the land. So this is 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 to 21. And this is what it says. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. Now listen to these details because this is really important. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field. And Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. And it says, Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, first let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye and then I will go back to you. Elijah replied, go back, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. Verse 21, so Elisha returned to to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. This is this moment of burning the ships, right? All of a sudden, Elijah shows up. He's like, hey, I'm choosing you. And uh, Elijah shows up and Elisha's like, oh, I got to just let me go say bye to my mom and dad. And I think somewhere on his journey back to his mom and dad, he thought, I need to destroy everything I have. So it's this weird thing if you think about it. Like, like I'm going to go say goodbye to my parents. But actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill all my my entire livelihood. I'm going to kill all my oxen. I'm going to burn all my plows. And I'm going to feed the people. And then I'm going to go after the calling that I believe I'm called to do. He's saying, I'm going forward. And I'm not going to let the things that I have now get in the way of the future that God has for me. This is this moment that Elisha is face to face with. And what I want to do today is I think there's some things in our life that we have to learn how to let go of. Some of the things in our life that we have to learn to leave in the past, to burn these things, to let go of them and not bring them into the future because so many of us, we're in this place where we're torn between the future and the past. We're, We're torn between what's happened to us and where we feel like we're supposed to go. And so we actually never go anywhere. We're just kind of stuck getting pulled in two different directions. We know what we want. We know what we feel like God has called us to, but we've never made it. We've never actually made it to the place that we thought we would go to. We never actually got to this place where we're like, okay, finally I'm living in a place where I know God wanted me to be. There's some things 
that we have to let go of. And what we do is we let go of these things. We burn them to fuel or to kickstart the vision that God has placed inside of us, to kickstart our future. And the reality is, is either it's going to work or it's not. Right? Elisha, he gave up it all. He burned it all, killed all his animals, and he said, I'm going. To be honest, he probably didn't fully understand what the next several years of his life would look like. He didn't probably get the miracles he was going to see. He probably didn't understand it all, but he just knew God had opened a door, and he said, I'm following God. I'm following the calling. I'm following this place to go. So I want to give us three of the most prolific things we hold on to that we actually need to let go of. And number one, we have to burn is we have to burn the distractions. Now, the past few weeks, I've been talking about distraction a lot because I think it's something that's so prevalent in our society, at least prevalent in my life. I don't know about your life, but there's a lot of distractions around us. You know, we, we, there's so many things that, that we get distracted by. So the question we have to ask ourselves, and I really want us to contemplate this, is what is distracting you from living a life fully committed to Jesus? What is, what is distracting you from living a life that Jesus has called us to live, which we read through Scripture, the, the way of Jesus, right? As we follow him, what is distracting us from living our life fully committed to him? What's, what's distracting you from stepping into the vision God has placed inside of you? What is distracting you from having the courage to go forward? We need to learn how to burn the distractions. And you know what this might look like? It might look like putting a limit on our social media intake every week. It might put, mean putting a limit on how much Disney Plus we devour during a week. It might, putting, it might be putting a limit on how much time you spend at the office. It might, be, it, it might be putting a limit on things in your life so that way you can be fully present in every moment God has called you to be present in. You know what I think a pandemic in our society is right now? Is being present. Like for real. I can't tell you how many times Jane is trying to have a conversation with me and I'm so preoccupied, right? My mind is thinking about the church or my mind is thinking about, you know, what I have to do tomorrow for work or my mind is so... so taken by my phone or by the television. I'm watching sports and Jane's just like, dad, I just want to have this conversation with you. And I don't even hear her talking. Like, it's not that like I'm ignoring her. It's like, I literally sometimes don't even hear her voice because my mind is so crowded. It's so chaotic. It's so loud from the noise. I don't even hear my own daughter trying to have a conversation with me. And how many of us, we feel the same way, right? So distracted. If the enemy can't destroy you, he'll distract you. And sometimes the distractions are good things. But they're holding us back from what's best. And we see this clearly in Luke chapter 10. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. What a privilege that would have been, right? Jesus is coming over for dinner, right? How many of y'all, that'd be the cleanest your house has ever been? And you're, you, you might even consider hiring a professional chef if you're not good at cooking, like for real. Like, like it's like, I'm gonna give Jesus the best, right? And this is Martha's attitude. So he said he welcomed him uh, into her home and her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. This is it, and this is us. This is a lot of us, verse 40. But Martha was distracted. What was she distracted by? A big dinner that she was preparing for Jesus. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair? Right? Sounds like a child, right? When your kids are fighting and they're like, Dad, isn't it unfair? They stole my favorite toy. And like, you haven't even touched it for four weeks. This is exactly this moment. She's like, Lord, like, 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 she's horrible. Doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here? Well, I do all the work. (laughs) And then I love this. Tell her to come help me. Right? It's like, you have more authority than me. You tell her that she's doing the wrong thing. But the Lord looked, said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all the details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. 
And Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. This is a moment of distraction. And to be honest, the distraction wasn't something horrible. Like it wasn't like she was distracted, like doing something she shouldn't have been doing. Like she's cooking a meal for the savior of the world, right? Like that's a pretty big job. But sometimes we get so distracted by, he says, even the details. We get so distracted and upset and worried about so many things that sometimes worry is our biggest distraction. We're so worried about our finances or we're so worried about, about our health. We're so worried and worried about our job and we're worried. And it's exhausting. And so what's happening is we're so distracted by worry and stress and we're so distracted by anxiety. We're so distracted that sometimes we don't even realize that God is trying to teach us something right in that moment. See, Martha was distracted. But Mary was just sitting at his feet learning and spending time in his presence. I don't think Martha understood how limited the time was going to be. She probably didn't understand that Now, this might be the only moment that Jesus actually enters her home for a meal. And I think if we go through life, I think all of us, at least for me, what I'm trying to do now is every single time something is happening, I want to be fully present in it because we never know when it's going to be over. We never know when the moment is going to end. We see how fragile life is. So let's stop being worried about so many details and stop being distracted by worry, but let us shift our focus away from the distraction. So what distracts you the most from the life you believe you were called to live? Is it the noise and the chaos or is it technology and entertainment? Is it what your future might look like? Is it your past still creeping in and preventing you from creating a better future? Is, is it your job? Is it, is it your work? Is it your business? Is it serving? Is it going to the gym? Is it, is it watching sports? Like, What's distracting you? Are you distracted by trying to build your own kingdom and your, your own wallet here on earth? Are you distracted by, by trying to keep up your appearances with the, those around you, with your neighbors and your friends? Are you so distracted by keeping up? You're missing out. I think we all have things in our lives that distract us in deep and profound ways. But the thing about distraction is how many times you not even realize you're distracted, right? You don't realize it. Why? Because you're, fo- you're focused. But your focus is on the wrong thing. So sometimes we don't even realize we're distracted because our focus is in the wrong place. You know, Elisha, he saw an opportunity of a lifetime in front of him, right? To give up everything and step through the door. Then he took full advantage of that moment. He was present enough to realize this is my future and I'm not gonna let, let anything get in the way of it. Not even the best things in my life. And then the second um, thing we have to learn how to burn is we have to learn to burn the negative words. I'm sure you've had people tell you in your life you couldn't do it, right? You weren't old enough, you're not young enough, you're not smart enough. You know, I was talking to somebody I'm a big sports fan, and one thing, if you watch sports, it makes you feel extremely old. Like, for real. Because they're like, this guy is the oldest guy in the league. He's like, he just turned 32. Right? Like, it's like these guys are retiring, they're like 25 years old. And, and the announcer's like, that guy is so old, I don't know if he's going to be able to play another year. His knee gave out last year, he's done. Retire, he's washed up, let him go. Sometimes we just get so confused by how old or young. and we just, Again, we're so worried about how people perceive us. We're not smart enough or we're not dumb enough or we're not athletic enough or we're not creative enough or we're not a good father, we're not a good mother, we're not a good sister. We get so caught up in what people have said about us. I think we have to learn to let go. We've all had negative things spoken over us. And the thing about these negative words, and this is the thing that's so unfortunate and heartbreaking, is that oftentimes the negative things spoken over us come from the people that we trusted the most, right? Sometimes our parents have said things they said out of anger or out of hunger, right? Out of exhaustion. That have really hurt us to the core. Maybe it was our teachers or our principals or our friends or our coworkers or our boss that say things and we let a moment like that, sometimes it's like such a small moment, 
We let it literally define who we are. And I think I've shared this story before. Um, but uh, when I was in school, I, I was a little bit of a troublemaker in school. Because, yeah, oh. Like, I think I've shared this too. When I was in kindergarten, um, I was so disruptive that I was the only student in my class, and maybe in the history of that school, where I had a daily journal that my mom and my, my teacher would write each other's letters about me every day, like for real. It was like, Dustin was distracted today. Someone splashed water on him, so he threw him into the wall. Like, true story in kindergarten. And a few years later, same school, we had a parent-teacher interview. I don't know if it's worse for parents or, or, or for the students. I don't know. It's, it's just like, it's tough, right? And I remember the, the principal of the school looked at me. I think I've showed this before, but he said, this school is for everyone. But then looked at me and said, but not everyone's for this school. So he said to me. And you know what's so interesting about this? Is that it, it's like, to be honest, like, it wasn't like the most hurtful thing. Like, you know, I was a young kid. But do you know how, how many years I held on to that? How many years I held, held on to this thought and this for real that I thought I was dumb? I thought I was so stupid. Like I thought, like I, I was always struggling in school. And I thought, wow, I'm so stupid for years after this. But this is, this is a verse that I want to read to us. If you're in that moment where something someone spoke over you years ago is still haunting you and still taking over and taking, like, like really hurting you today, I want you to hear this, Romans 13, 6. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. Why? So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? You know where our confidence comes from? It doesn't come from our abilities, right? It doesn't come from what people say about us. It doesn't come from, you know, our glory years in high school when we were like all state on the football team, right? It's like, that was a long time ago. What can mere people do to me? And this is the truth. Let's, let's believe the truth about who Jesus says you are. And you might look at me and say, I don't know who Jesus says I am. I want to encourage you. Read the Bible. It's a love story of redemption for you. How much he loves you and how much he cares about you. He loves you so much. And you know, we sang this song, Waymaker, before. And I, I, this is the most random story I was thinking about when I was thinking about, like, God being our waymaker. My, when I was younger, uh, we went to West Edmonton Mall, and they just got rid of it, but the roller coaster, West Edmonton Mall, you know what I'm talking about? Rode that roller coaster. Uh, when I went, when I was real young, my cousin came, and he was literally, like, two centimeters too short to ride it. Like, two centimeters. And he was so devastated. And so what we did is we went to McDonald's for lunch to figure out how do we get him on the roller coaster? You know what we did? We took McDonald's wrappers and put them in his shoe. For real. Super dangerous, okay? Like, that's probably why they, sh they closed her down. You know what I'm talking about? And he, they, we put these McDonald's wrappers in his shoe. We go back. It's a new attendant. Measures him. He's tall enough. Rides the roller coaster. And he didn't die. So. But I, that's such a, again, it's just a random story. But we have a God who makes a way no matter what. Like even if the world says that, 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 that it's not going to work, even if people have told us we can't do it, even if people have said it, God says, guess what, I'm not done with you yet. He says, if you're still breathing, I'm not done. And so we need to stop holding on to the things people have spoken over us. Why? Because, we're, because if we believe that's who we are, that's where we're going to live. We're going to live in the fact that we're dumb. We're going to make decisions based on the fact that I'm not smart enough. We're going to make decisions based on the fact that I'm not educated enough. I'm not going to apply for the job. I'm not going to do this. Why? Because I'm not good enough. And God looks at us and says, I created you. And what it says when he created humanity, he said, it's very good. I, th I believe that God, if he calls you to something, He'll prepare you for it. He'll qualify you to do it. I believe that God is calling you higher. He, he's calling you farther. He's calling you deeper. And he will give you what you need. He will give you the courage you need to burn the things people have said about you. To step into the future that he has for you. 
We go on his strength and we go with his words and we go with his heart and we go with his love. We have to learn to burn the things holding us back. The words that have been holding, holding me captive for years and years. So often as human beings, we, we let the things spoken of over us dictate where we go. I want to read that verse again. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? And that's the truth. Let's believe that. that we are confident in him, not in ourselves, and not in the approval of others. And I want to share this next thought is this. We have to burn the shiny things. You know, often the burning of the ships is the burning of something valuable and something good. However, this is the reality is that our future comes at a cost. And our calling will come at a cost. You read through the Bible. When God called somebody, it wasn't always an easy, an easy journey. How many hardships do you read through scripture? And it's like, man, I'm glad that's not me. Elisha had to burn his plows. And not just a couple plows. Like he had 12 teams of oxen and plows. Imagine you see Elisha running back and you're like still working in the field. He's like, guys, burn it all. Kill all the animals. They're so like, bro, like I need a job. He's like, I, I'm letting go of all of it. He was building a plowing empire, this guy. 12 teams. He was successful. It's not like God called them out of the, out of the pit. Like God called them in a lot of our eyes would have been the mountaintop. Success, money, like he had it. Yet he still looked at it and said, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. I need to go to my calling. Often the best is on the other side of the good. We have to be in tune with what God is speaking and seek good counsel and follow his voice. Often the hardest things to sacrifice are the good things. But oftentimes, Sometimes the hardest things to sacrifice are the pleasurable things. Second Samuel 11, one to four. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to go get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. And I think, you know, when I read this story, there's like a part of me that's like, David, you dummy, like, right? But then there's a part of me like, I've been there, right? It starts like this. In the spring of the year when kings normally go to war, what does David do? Stays home to walk on top of his palace. You know, we often get into trouble when we're where we aren't supposed to be. So when we're not where we're supposed to be, we see, we see things we're not supposed to see. And how quickly can this happen with technology, right? Advertisements and all these things. Maybe you get an advertisement for the new person, you're like, got to get it. Got to buy it. You know, David got so distracted by something shiny, he took it. How often do you and I do this? We, the things we think will make us happy, the things that we think will bring us the most pleasure, the things that we think will make us powerful or famous end up being the exact thing that destroys us. The shiny things that seem so attractive and we, we want it so badly that it actually, actually disrupts our future. Sometimes it's not even something big. But something, sometimes it's actually something so small that, that distracts us. It's the shiny things that you know, we, we see and we're like, I gotta go get it. 
Proverbs 4, 25 says this, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet and stay on the safe path. This verse right here, don't get sidetracked. Don't get distracted. Keep your feet from following evil. Don't get sidetracked. sidetracked. Because what happens when we do, we start going the wrong direction. You know, maybe, I don't know why David stayed home, right? It's a unique thing. He's supposed to go to war. Why did he stay home? Maybe he was tired. Maybe he thought, oh, man, like, what a long battle we just had. I'm staying home. You know, maybe he thought he deserved it. Maybe he just didn't care. Do not let the shiny things distract you. We have to learn how to burn those things. To be in the right place and to fix our eyes on the right things and focus on Jesus. See, the shiny things will always try and come back. They'll trick you into thinking that the past was better. And remember when things were comfortable. Remember when things were consistent. Remember when we didn't have this challenge. Or remember when we didn't have this, this. Remember when we knew everything. And remember when we had that house. Or remember when we had that car. Remember when things were easier. Remember when I didn't own a business and I just worked for somebody else? Do you remember? The future isn't easy. The future comes at the cost of the past. And when we burn the ships, we say, I'm done with the past. I'm going forward no matter the cost. And I want to end with this one last uh, thought today. Don't burn the people. Burn the distractions, burn the shiny things, but don't burn the people. We never burn the people. This doesn't mean we allow bad people to influence us or that we let them walk all over us. We let them manipulate us. They let them control us. No. We might not even have a relationship with them, but the bridge to them we will never burn. It doesn't mean that there's relationship. It doesn't mean they're close. I truly believe that God can change people. I truly, truly, truly believe he can. And you know what our responsibility is? This is so hard. Is to not gossip. To not talk poorly about people when they're not in the room. But it's to talk highly of people and respect people. You know, if you look at the life of Jesus, this is, he did this so beautifully You know, Jesus, if you remember, he was betrayed by his closest friends. And not just like a peace out way, like a running away naked way. Like a denying him three times way. Like a he's at the cross, there's barely any of his friends even there in this hardest moment. He goes to the garden to pray, his friends are sleeping in his darkest, hardest, traumatic moment. He's abandoned by his friends to suffer practically alone. But you know what's so fascinating? Is that when Jesus comes back from the bed, from the dead, he didn't go to John and say, what were you doing? He didn't go to Judas. He didn't say, Judas, what a horrible, horrible person. Do you know what I truly believe is that if Jesus had, Judas had come back to Jesus, I truly believe he would have been welcomed right back. Now, I can't say that for sure because I'm not Jesus. I'm not Judas. He, he didn't look at and say, Don't get me started on Peter. Denying me three times? I'm done with you. Do you know what he said? He said, here's my wounds. Do you believe now? And then he goes, I'm sending you to change the world. Let's not burn the people. I'm not saying have a relationship with people that have hurt you. But be praying for them. Be praying for the people who have hurt you. That's a hard place to go. You know, I think one of the best ways you can know if you've forgiven somebody is if you can pray for them. So I just want to close with this, is that as we learn to burn the ships, let us let go of the things tying us down. Let us let go of the things and step into the great things that God has in store for us. He is something for each and every one of us. But we have to figure out the things that are distracting us. And we have to burn the things that people have said about us. We have to burn the shiny things 
that draw us to them. Our takeaway today is that your future comes at the cost of your past. We burn the ships to get rid of the distractions, quiet the negative voices, and not let the past draw us back in. You know, I want to pray for us about this. I think that there's some things that we've maybe been holding on to for a long time that we need to let go of. I think there's some things in our lives, all of us have, I think these moments that we just have to learn to give it to God. And Jesus said, come to me, all are weary and heavy burden. I will give you rest. And I think our souls desperately need rest from so many things. So let us learn to burn those things and step into the future that God has for us. So Father, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are moving. We thank you. But God, today we come to you and we say, God, help us let go of the distractions. Help us let go of the things that are holding us back from the future you want us to live and the life that you've called us to live and and the things getting in the way of our relationships. Help us learn to burn those things. And God, help us learn to burn the negative voice, the things people have spoken over us that are still affecting us today. The things that are still creeping in today. God, help us learn how much you love us, how much you care about us and who you say we are. And God, help us uh, burn the, the shiny things that try and come in that we get so caught up in that we're trying to build our own thing. God, help us stay focused. Keep our eyes on you so I get sidetracked, not get distracted. But be focused on you in Jesus' name. Amen.